Ariane Segelitz Carsten. I am filling in for Maria today, who is not available today. Um, I'm a business development manager at Cloud and Key Technologies and also very involved in all of the Alaska activities. And so I will be your host today and uh, guide you through this session. Now, um, oh, wait. All right, let's look at the very slim agenda for today. We will dive into today's Tech Talk in just a minute, and we will have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. And then um, we will move on to some events and news that we can share. Um, also, there is a new date and time for the Tech Talks in general. Um, so yes, we will share that with you and then also peek into what's awaiting us in August for the Tech Talk number eight. So now without further ado, um, let's look at today's Tech Talk. It's the Alaska Tech Talk number seven, which is uh, amazing that we've come this far already. Um, we have Patrick here today, Patrick team from, from Cloud NT Technologies. He's actually a colleague of mine. Hi, Patrick. It's good to have you. And uh, we have this very uh, interesting um, title, Unleashing the Kraken, Harnessing the Power of Kraken, for optimal Kubernetes workload management, a very uh, powerful title as well. Um, before I hand the stage over to you, let me briefly introduce you. So uh, Patrick is an R&D software engineer at Cloud NT Technologies. He has his diploma in business informatics uh, with his focus on data science and data analytics. Um, he has been with Cloud NT since 2021 and is the lead of the whole Krake development and also the um, deputy lead of the team Cloud Innovation. So he is very enthusiastic about what he's doing. And so without further ado, I will hand the stage over to you and stop my screen sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me also. And so let me share my screen, my whole screen. Um, you should now see the slides. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Then let's start. So as you already heard um, the title, uh, Unleashing the Krake, Harnessing the Power of Krake for Optimal Kubernetes Workload Management. It's a powerful um, title, but it's also Krake is a powerful tool with a lot of uh, functionalities. And I will present them today in this tech talk to you. Um, so what Krake is, Krake is basically an open source tool for application lifecycle management uh, on distributed infrastructure. So that distributed infrastructure will uh, is the main focus. So we will hear a lot about this today and let's get right into it. That, uh, by the way, that is our Krake logo there on top, a uh, very cute logo. Um, the agenda for today is we will dive into the motivation and the objectives of, of Krake. So what we want to achieve with Krake, what, what is the purpose of Krake? Then next up would be the architecture of Krake as well as the functionalities. Then I will give a short demonstration of Krake in, uh, in the terminal. And uh, last but not least, I will give some additional information about Krake and around of Krake. So, yeah, but let's take a look at the motivation and objectives first. Um, so we can imagine that, yeah, we want to push the limits. A user wants to um, place high compute intensive jobs like machine learning, artificial intelligence, rendering, but maybe even a, a website hosting or something like that into a modern data center. So this modern data center, as you can see here, is located in Germany. The, the shape of the gray plane there is Germany. And we can outscale that. And now we have the whole Europe here displayed. And um, the current trend is that these jobs are distributed in different data centers so that the user can decide where to put its, his jobs, his or her jobs. Uh, in different cloud systems, on different platforms, in different data centers, and so on and so on. And he would do that manually, basically. Um, so 
there are other aspects to some data centers maybe, like we have in Spain a waste heat recovery uh, or a very performant one. Um, we could also have in Finland renewable energies and in Germany maybe the data center is the, uh, really modern. And what that means is uh, the user needs to basically put these workloads, these jobs manually in those data centers. What Krake is doing, uh, it is basically automating um, the whole process and is, we call it the software defined energy optimization, but you can use it for other aspects as well. So energy optimization is just our go-to um, term here because at Cloud and Heat, we, we like sustainability and uh, green energy and uh, stuff like that. Also waste heat recovery. And so we focus mainly on that aspect, but you can use it whatever, like ever you want. Uh, so we have a load distribution with Krake, we have a load migration with Krake, we have flexible job execution and also metering and monitoring. Um, especially the metering and monitoring as well as the migration. Um, I will talk later on that in the functionality part. But uh, here you can see that those jobs, compute jobs, are automatically pushed through Krake into distributed uh, data centers and yeah, are put there mostly where the high, highest efficiency score is, uh, is held, so to say. So our solution, intelligent load management. And next up, uh, one word about the metrics uh, I, I said before I, uh, I mentioned before. So we have different kind of metrics, custom metrics we can put into Krake that Krake is aware of different metrics. Like you can imagine economical or legal ones like a price or laws or security ones. Look, you can think of technical ones like latency or is there a high compute demand something like that, or even, as I mentioned, ecological ones for like energy availability or heat demand or maybe other sustainability scores. So you're, you're open to define your own metrics and use them in, in Krake with Krake. So we will then go to the second part, which is the architecture and the functionalities. But first, some words about the Krake project itself, about the history. So it was designed and developed and initiated uh, at Cloud and Heat in August 2018. It was then refactored and within and put into a new architectural uh, model and was introduced in July 2019. And also in this in this year in October, it went open source. And since then it has been open source, it stayed there and was continuously um, developed further. And the license we use is the Apache license 2.0. So everyone can use it commercially as well. Um, there is no are no boundaries, so to say. And everyone can also participate in the development. Um, it's focused on distributed data centers. It's focused on software energy efficiency. And it's also focused on containerized applications. So like Docker, you can put Docker images uh, or image, Docker images into a Docker container and this Docker container would then run in a pod in, in a Kubernetes cluster basically. So we um, focus on, on that aspect, um, especially Kubernetes clusters. You will um, hear about that more uh, later. And also we focus on compute intensive tasks um, that is not um, narrowed down to that, but it's uh, it's uh, really uh, logical if you think of energy um, consumption and high compute compute intensive tasks um, uh, need the most energy, so it basically makes sense there. Um, and also to mention here, it's written completely in Python, so we have some. Ginger template stuff there, but mainly it's written in Python. So um, that's that. What is under the hood? So um, this graphic, a lot is a lot is going on here in this graphic. I know. So uh, on the lower part we have Krake, the Krake plane, so to say, 
um, with its API, its scheduler, its controller, um, planes, and the database. The database is an ETCD database we use there, and it communicates with the API and the users and the administrators are communicating with the API as well. And everything is basically communicating with the API. It's a REST interface. And uh, that is basically the heart of Krake, which is used to communicate with other things, like also the scheduler and the controllers. For each aspect um, of real world objects so to say we have uh, different controllers like we have a kubernetes application controller for um, 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 um controlling kubernetes applications and we also have a kubernetes um, cluster controller for yeah uh, for controlling kubernetes clusters but we also have infrastructure an infrastructure controller where we can uh, control what uh, resources are created basically Right now, it's um, focused on also Kubernetes clusters, so we can, with that infrastructure controller, um, create Kubernetes clusters. Um, the scheduler, on the other hand, is uh, selecting and deciding where to put those um, um, workloads, those applications, and that uh, come into place the, the upper half, which is the data center plane or the real world object plane where we have several data centers. We can see that they are layered there. We have metrics providers like Prometheus or InfluxDB. InfluxDB there is in, uh, displayed in red because it's not right now implemented, but it's currently under development. Um, I'm doing that myself right now. Um, and we will have another yeah, tool support for, for InfluxDB uh, soon. That's nice. So you're not uh, then uh you you don't you don't do not have to use prometheus you can also use InfluxDB then for your metrics for your custom metrics and you also have uh, compute platforms um which we can register in krake we can register plain kubernetes clusters um without uh without uh, a cloud um, platform under it so you have an open stack we can also register OpenStax in as a cloud resource in Krake, but we also can play uh, register plain Kubernetes clusters in Krake. Um, OpenShift shift as well is here displayed as red because it could be possible to do that sometime in the future if it is needed, but right now it's not um, under development, but it is planned sometime in the future. Yeah. So on what the, these metrics providers basically are doing, they observe and monitor the different data centers and the dis different compute platforms and uh, provide custom metrics um, for them. So that can that Krake is aware of them and can score um, each data center and each compute platform um, to decide on where to put the workloads on. So, and on the left, you can see the administrator and the user Basically, the administrator is registering data centers, configuring metrics providers, and configuring scheduling algorithms. Um, that is, yeah, a, a whole lot of configuration there. And the user basically simply puts applications into Krake, registers applications, or creates applications, which are then handled automatically. Um, administrator and user could also be the same person, so that is not necessary to um, to be two different persons, but it's just displayed here for convenience. And uh, now we talk about the functionalities of Krake. So I mentioned several of them, but um, we will go in detail here. Um, first of all, the deployment of Kubernetes applications itself based on user requirements and scheduling metrics. Then we have the periodic reevaluation of the applications placement and migration. We also have a functionality which scales autom automatically scales down the application when the process is finished. And last but not least, we have the deployment of Kubernetes clusters to host Kubernetes applications itself on cloud resources. First of all, the deployment and scheduling of an application. So uh, imagine on the right, you can see you have three data centers, uh, each with Kubernetes clusters on it. 
and you would have and, and they are basically may, maybe um, located in different areas like two are in Germany one is in France and the ones in Germany are scored with a 10 with a 5 and the one in France is scored with a 40 that means um, the metrics that um, go into Krake are uh, calculated in the in the algorithm to be to do um, be displayed or to be uh, calculated broken down to this efficiency score and what Krake is now doing or the user is doing the user creates an application with the constraint that it should run in Germany due, due to um, some some things um, maybe law things or legal things or something like that but that uh, doesn't matter now it just says location equals germany and what crack is now doing it evaluates which of the registered kubernetes clusters suits best for that and because of the constraint that it should run in germany and that the efficiency score is best at in data center one um, it will place the application automatically to data center one in the Kubernetes cluster at data center one without the constraint. So if the user would create an application without the constraint, it would automatically be um, placed into the data center into the Kubernetes cluster on data center three in France. So, and that's it for that. After that, um, maybe the, the scheduling metrics are changing dynamically and um, Krak is also periodically re-evaluating the placement of the applications that are running currently in Krake. And um, now data center two, for example, changes its score from five to 20, but it's still located in Germany. The application we scheduled was also uh, flagged, uh, labeled as Germany. And now the, the score is better in data center two than in data center one. That means Krake is without the intervention of the user again, uh, automatically migrating the application from data center one to data center two. This can be done for stateless applications. Like, yeah, you don't need uh, much data to, to run it, uh, the application uh, or even data at all so it can just roll out and run and maybe it's a web interface or something like that um, that would be stateless for example uh, we but we also assist uh, state for application migration right now with an external database you can then plug in but it, that is application logic on in, in that part you can plug in a minio bucket and just send your, uh, maybe you have a machine learning training or running or something like that, or deep learning uh, with a neural network. And you would send uh, into the MinIO bucket your states, your checkpoints, and then you, it can be uh, migrated in a, another location to another location. And there you can, um, you can download the state from the MinIO bucket again. That is application logic, as I said and the application would then continue until it finishes. And we are also working on the direct data transfer from Kubernetes cluster to Kubernetes cluster, but that is just under development. And then we also have the automatic scale down of an application. So maybe an application, maybe it wasn't stateful application. Uh, it has been migrated to data center two. After a while, maybe it's a really big um, neural network it trains for several days you do not have to check um, constantly and observe the the process of the application but someday it, it's finished and it will just scale down and notify Krake that is ha it has finished and then it's gone from the kubernetes cluster and makes space for other jobs for example um, here I can say that we also uh, working or want to work on um, a notification system or so, something like that, um, where the user would get notif notified via email or something like that to um, be aware that, hey, your job has finished, but right now that is not, um, not yet done, but can be done for sure. 
And last but not least, the cloud backend support. So we could um, register several OpenStack projects, for example, into Krake. Um, there are, um, sorry for that, they are uh, then displayed as um, clouds, cloud resources in Krake. And on top of these cloud resources, we can then schedule. Um, yeah, Kubernetes cluster basic Kubernetes clusters basically, um, which are then created. So the VMs are created in the OpenStack project, and on top of them, the Kubernetes cluster would be also deployed. And we are using right now third-party tools for that. We have one third-party tool already supported. It's called Infrastructure Manager. It's from a um, research project. Um, I'm working in, it's called AI Sprint, um, developed by the University of Valencia. And we are using that infrastructure manager to create Kubernetes clusters in cloud resources. And we want to extend even the possibilities of Krake and um, support other infrastructure providing tools like other tools, like uh, the OpenStack copy provider, for example. That is some future. Um, thing, but yeah, just to mention here. And yeah, after that, after the Kubernetes cluster was um, deployed, that takes up to 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, um, the user can then um, put applications on it, so to say. So next up would be the, would be the demonstration. And here um, I will demonstrate the prerequisites. So we register clusters. We associate some metric providers and metrics. And then uh, in the second part, we were going to deploy a Kubernetes application based on user requirements and scheduling metrics. And we also so, uh, would um, watch the periodic re-evaluation of the applications, placement, and migration. So without Further ado, I will just switch here my screen. There we go. So here you can see um, the terminal. And on the right, you can see a Grafana dashboard, which just is there to display what's going on. And we also de uh, pre prepared a short demo showcase, um, that, which means it, it's written in Go. So it's, uh, executing some stuff after the hour so that I do not have to interfere with the console too much. But yeah, uh, just for practical purposes. So um, we start the showcase with um, step zero, the prerequisites. We're registering two classes now with labels and metrics. And first of all, we check, hey, are there any clusters yet? Uh, register and we use rock for that. Uh, rock cube cluster list uh, would give us the list of the clusters registered in Krake or an, an empty list if there's nothing registered right now. Uh, rock is our CLI tool. Um, and as you can see, there is nothing there yet. So we went on, uh, or we move on and register a cluster into Krake with rock cube cluster register dash K for a um, kubeconfig file. And we use a kubeconfig cube file for that. Um, looks like that. You can see in the state, it is pending right now because it was created right now. And the Kubernetes cluster has been created. We can also see that there are right now no labels, um, label constraints or labels um, registered and also no metrics. And we see that the cluster, Kubernetes cluster one, is living in the system admin namespace. We have uh, namespaces also in, in, in Krake. And we see the created date with time and the modified date with time. We also would see a deleted time, but we had just have created it, so there's none. And the state shows online now. That is set because we the state changed from pending to online, and now we have a um, we have a cluster observer, uh, a real cluster observer, uh, which um, interferes or which observes the cluster statuses um, states uh, by calling the Kubernetes API. Um, 
we also have a state with unhealthy and offline, so it, it's working. Um, then we have the register registration of the metrics provider and some metrics used for the scheduling. Um, it's, it's a long, long command here, so um, it's basically core. It uses the core API of Krake, which um, which um, controls the metric stuff and uh, metric provider stuff. So GMP stands for a global metrics provider, and we create now a sustainability score from the types uh, metrics provider with the type static. We use a static metrics provider here. That means um, it doesn't change um, dynamically its values which are given, but we can update the, the static metrics provider manually to um, showcase here uh, the functionality of Krake. So it's, it's basically some um, uh, demo showcase for, for a demo showcase, more like, more like that. We also see some other stuff like um, the sustainability score one is at eight and the a sustainability score two is at five. You will see that uh, on the right um, soon. That is, it changes. Um, so you see that these have been registered. Here's a uh, short, uh, uh, short excursion here. We are ranking the clusters um, by uh, multiplying the metric scores or the, or the metrics with its uh, corresponding weight and um, sum it up and basically that would be the score you can see now on the right that kubernetes cluster one has a score of eight and kubernetes cluster two has a score of five uh, we also can get a list of them of the stat of the metrics providers we also have another metrics provider registered here um, prometheus but right now the sustainability score one is the static one and this one we use and you can also see uh, down there that the sustainability score one is eight and the second one is five. So we get these information from Krage. Now we update um, the cluster with, with labels. So location um, Germany, for example, and we also um, give, the, give the cluster some uh, metrics uh, with, uh, with a weight. So for cluster one, we go with sustainability score one with a weight of two. So there. There you have it. Uh, the metrics uh, part is now filled in the table there, and also the label part would be filled with location Germany. The Kubernetes cluster has been updated, and we can also see it in the cluster list. The labels are there, and also the modified section uh, shows a different timestamp. So then we go on and create the second cluster with a sustainability score two with a weight of one. Um, also, same thing, and both clusters has been created, have been created, and you can see them here with its corresponding labels and so on. Now, that would be the first part. Now, in the second part, we schedule an application and watch how it is rescheduled if it changed the metrics. So. So no applications are currently registered in Quagga. We can, again, use the ROC for that. ROC cube application list gives us the application list, nothing there. And the current metrics value uh, of the first cluster is, or the, the, the score value is higher with eight. That means um, if we put now a demo application there, it will be scheduled automatically to the first cluster. So we can wait some time. Yeah, you can see it um, in the list. It is running now. So at creation time, it was pending. Now it is running. And on the right, you can see that the app counter um, bumped up to one because the score is eight. Now, um, since uh, it has been scheduled on cluster one, we can also get the application, some information on that, what is going on. We uh, also get the service with its IP and so on. And we can also see the application running on the Kubernetes cluster itself with kubectl-kubeconfig and so on. With get deployment, we see 
that there is a deployment living in the Kubernetes cluster called Echo Demo um, with an age of uh, 43 seconds. So it was recently put there. And we can also curl it and get some information back. Nothing special here, it's just an echo demo, but we, we see that the client address uh, matches the one we curl and uh, which is the display uh, dip, uh, displayed in the in the application get command uh, in Krake. So now um, we again get the current sustainability score, which is eight and five for the different clusters. And we can update them to be five and eight. So we change that. Now it's five and eight. And you will see that on the right, it takes some time, maybe. Um, sometimes the, the, the Kraker, Kraker is reevaluating um, and watching it uh, periodically, but uh, not continuously um, uh, every second, but every other second. So now you can see on the right that for the second cluster, the app counter has gone to one. And for the first cluster, it has gone to zero. That means the application was successfully uh, rescheduled. Now we can get again the echo demo one. And we see that the IP changed. It was beforehand, it was something like, let me see uh, here. Um, 192, 168, 0, 235. And now at the end, it's uh, 85. So it changed. Uh, it also says here, schedule two and running on cluster two. So that worked. Um, the application now run, runs on the second cluster. We can call it again. We can uh, get uh, another, um, another IP address and that's it. So we can update again the sustainability score to be uh, again better for cluster one and it would would then automatically uh, automatically change back and we will have would have um, the application running again in cluster one we will wait a short amount of time here there it is it's switched back now it's living again in cluster one and yeah, and cluster two, there's no application left. That's it, we can now delete the application to make room and to end our demo here. And we can see there's no longer an application present. On the right, uh, the app counter would soon go to zero again. Yep, there it is. and. That's it for the demo part, demo part. So now I switch back to my presentation. Since I want to go forward here, let me check here, please. Uh, start. Cannot start apparently because the layer. Ah, here we go. Layer of Zoom was interfering there. Okay, so and now some additional information. Last but not least, um, yeah, are there maybe other open source tools like Kraken? Um, we continuously keep an eye on other tools and evaluating other tools. We have done um, this state of the art anal analysis uh, for other or regarding other tools to search for them. Um, we certainly didn't find all of them, <laughs> but we have found some of them. So, and, and also some of them are not like Krake at all, but you don't, you, you, you never know beforehand, uh, uh, only when you take a deep, deep dive in those, uh, in those tools itself. And I'm also not fully uh, a, a full expert in all these tools. So if we have someone here who is really familiar with Kamada or Lico or even Gardner uh, and some things are not right here, tell us, um, that's no problem. But our findings um, uh, found, found this. So 
we have Krake on top, uh, you can see, then we have Kamada, then we have Liko, Starling X, Admiralty, Gardner, and Tensile Cube. That these are the two tools we found, which are we which could be similar to Krake. And um, we searched for or researched for some aspects like multi-cluster management, custom metrics, support for app scheduling, um, automated workload migration. There's a little star there saying that across deep distributed different and heterogeneous Kubernetes clusters and multi-cluster topology. Just to explain multi-cluster topology is um, something uh, where um, several Kubernetes clusters can be uh, put together into a bigger cluster or an Uber cluster or an, um, some, some maxi cluster, something like that. And um, workloads would be then distributed um, down in these different Kubernetes clusters, living even on the different um, different cloud resources or infrastructure. That is somewhat similar to Krake, but not exactly, because Krake differ differentiates between Kubernetes clusters. So an application is only living in one ap uh, Kubernetes cluster at a time. So. Um, yeah, that said, um, Krake covers most of these um, these these uh, things here, but not the multi-cluster topology. But others do um, uh, cover the multi-cluster topology. For example, Lico. Um, there is something I uh, came up with where you we could imagine to leverage an, a maxi cluster from Lico, um, which is then registered in Krake and handled by Krake, and then you would also have the multi-cluster topology uh, supported by Krake itself. So Krake supports most of these um, things here, these aspects. Um, I will do not go into detail here for each of the tools, but um, from what we found, Krake is um, covering most of the things we want to achieve. Um, also, regarding um, the development of Krake, so it is continu continuously developed in several funded projects and in, in research projects. Um, ASPRINT is one of them, um, funded by the European Union Horizon. Um, I'm working on that in ASPRINT, and colleagues of mine working in Speaker, uh, Progressive KI, Telos and these all are covered and funded by the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. If you are interested in these projects, you can look them up uh, online uh, in the internet. There is several uh, are several information given, especially for AS Print. We have a web website you can take a look. It's really nice and interesting. Um, and last but not least, some more details about Krake. So I have put here the link of the repository of the documentation. Um, we will distribute. I think we will distribute the slides after the tech talk, so you can have a look yourself. Krake is also accepted in the GitLab Open Source Program, which is really nice. Um, so we have some benefits in GitLab because it's really open source. So we do not um, sell it or something like that. Um, it's test-driven development means uh, right now 93% of the code is unit tested. You can look it up in the um, in the GitLab repository, and the goal is to be above 95%. We we are fluctuating sometimes, and yeah, most features are also end-to-end -end tested, meaning we have real infrastructure behind the pipelines um, which test some functionalities and some planned features is we want to build a graphical user interface because right now it's all going on in the terminal. We want a Docker controller like a Kubernetes controller we, where we can place workloads directly in Docker on VMs without um, Kubernetes clusters. We want to integrate our other tool uh, at Cloud Heat called Yauk. We want to put the Yauk, the Yauk operator in Krake where we have the abil uh, um, ability to deploy uh, whole OpenStack projects, whole OpenStack instances 
for example, and automatically register them in Krake. We want to put in the OpenStack copy provider for um, better Kubernetes cluster creation. We want also to automate some Kubernetes cluster scaling things like uh, we have some jobs and they uh, need some more hardware behind it. So we scale up the Kubernetes cluster to have more worker nodes or something like that. And I also put here some links uh, where you can watch a demo video I made in AI Sprint. It's on YouTube, uh, showing another aspect um, together with another tool. Um, we also have an Elements community chat. You can say hello there if you are interested. And if you're interested in further talks or use case discussions, another demo showing more functionalities or something like that, just contact me, feel free. Um, would be nice. On the right, also, you can see a more, yeah, more simple uh, representation of our architecture. It's uh, located in our documentation. Yeah, you can see, you can have a look if you want to. That's that. Uh, thanks for the attention. And do you have any questions? Thank you so much, Patrick. That was really, really interesting. Um, I see one question in the chat. I'm not sure if this has been answered with your um, slide where you compare different tools. So we have the question, uh, has this tool been compared to Argo CD or other IAC apps? Um, not sure if that already was covered. Um, no, Argo CD is, was not, or it was not, not compared to Argo CD. And also, yet, yes to other infrastructure as code apps, yes, but um, Krake is not an infrastructure as code um, at, at the heart. <laughs> it's more like a workload um, uh, Kubernetes application uh, management tool with the ability to also um, create K Kubernetes clusters and to register them and to work with cloud backends, but not entirely for that purpose, but it has the site, uh, yeah, site uh, or the ability to that site ability, I would call it. But uh, even uh, if, if this, this uh, doesn't answer the, the question, feel free to ask for no problem. Seems like that answer was uh, perfectly fine, but I see another raised hand by Jens. Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, you said that you want to integrate the OpenStack um, copy provider mm -hmm. for uh, scaling up or spawning Kubernetes clusters. So what is the specific reason behind that? Because I, I think if you would use Gardner, for example, you can directly spawn clusters on different cloud infrastructures and so on and so forth, and you would be able to support a whole variety of cloud providers with one thing or tool. So from my perspective, that would also make sense. So do you have any, yeah, any thoughts on this? Um, could make sense. Uh, the OpenStack copy provider we want to uh, implement or to implement the support of it is because of uh, SCS, uh, Supering Cloud Stack Compliance because we want to be SCS compliant. And I think with Gardner, it's also SCS compliant, but I'm not sure about that. Um, but we can, uh, we can uh, consider even putting, uh, even implementing Gardner, yeah, for sure. Um, but we haven't thought about that yet deeply. I think also that Gardner is somewhat, yeah, it's, as you said, it's offering, a great uh, or a, a, a really big <laughs> variety of functionalities. Um, hmm, that is a whole other tool to be implemented or to be supported. So we need to evaluate that for sure. Um, maybe it's too much, too much, too many functionalities at once. Yeah, I, I just thought about this because it would be possible to support so many different clouds so that your sustainability model would really be reasonable in that case. So if you have a whole variety and yeah, but for sure you can also do that with different cluster provisioning strategies. Mm -hmm. 
No, it was it was just a question, not any. <laughs> yeah, yeah, also. that's okay, no problem. Um, but thank you for the question. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, just an uh, additional command uh, from uh, Mathieu um, that Kavi is also capable to spawn Kubernetes clusters on multiple supported backends like AWS, Azure, OpenStack, even uh, and the Kavi OpenStack providers, just one from supported providers. And yeah, that's, that's true basically. So we could also. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. But on the slide, I think it was. Um specifically mentioned the OpenStack provider. And that was the reason why I was asking. Okay, yeah. I actually also have one question because I'm thinking um, of our open source project, Yauk. For those who don't know, Yauk is a lifecycle management tool for OpenStack that is currently being developed in the Alaska Association. And I know that there are some ways to connect or to link uh, functionalities of, of Krake and Yauk. Maybe can you explain a little bit on that, Patrick? Uh, sure. Um, we want to implement or to integrate Yauk as an as an cloud providing uh, backend. Uh, like there are several project aspects in Yauk, like the, the operator that is a part which spawns or which deploys OpenStack um, instances on, Kubernetes, on a Kubernetes cluster. So we want to achieve that, that we can um, spawn in a whole OpenStack uh, cloud backend into a um, Kubernetes cluster by using Krake. So we have then a Krake command doing that. And um, after the successful cre creation of the cloud backend, it would be automatically um, registered in Krake. And after that, we can go on and uh, spawn Kubernetes clusters in these backends. And on top of that, we can then spawn or schedule applications. So that, that would be the overall goal. And maybe even we can later on uh, in the future leverage Yahoo's abilities to spawn Kubernetes clusters as another um, infrastructure providing tool to, to spawn Kubernetes clusters in cloud cloud backends um, because Yahoo clusters are somewhat special um, for this reason um, uh, regarding uh, some VPN stuff and other security hardened stuff. Um, so it would be also beneficial to include the Yahoo Kubernetes um, capabilities somewhat in in Krake as an infrastructure provider. But yeah, uh, we have plans for that and we are. Um, planning on doing that or beginning with that this summer. So, yeah. Nice. Thank you so much. We have a couple of more minutes. Are there any other questions? If not, I would uh, briefly share my screen again and uh, give you some information uh, on some some news. Patrick, if you could uh, stop your screen sharing. Sure. Thank you. Perfect. Mm -mm -mm. So there you go. It's always the Zoom, Zoom stuff being in the way. Give me a second here. That's not what I want to do. Oh, we just we just keep it like that. So um, now, if you have enjoyed this tech talk and you feel like you have something to, to share with us too in the future, uh, the stage could be yours. We are always looking for uh, other speakers, other interesting topics around uh, cloud infrastructures, around open source topics. If you're not 100% sure if your topic is fitting, that's perfectly fine. We can uh, totally help you with figuring that out. Um, so just drop us an email to our hello at alaska.cloud. Um, so that would be amazing. Um, now, very quickly on some news and events, uh, as announced earlier, we have a new time slot and a new day for the Alaska Tech Talks. Now for August, it still stays the same. It's uh, the last Thursday of the month, so August 31st at 2 p.m. 
However, starting on September 11, uh, sorry, starting on September, uh, we will always have our meetings on Friday, um, last Friday of the month, starting at 11 a.m. That is because we do have an overlap with uh, some Yauk meetings, and since Yauk is a very crucial part of Alaska, just as the Tech Talk, it's, it just makes sense to um, resolve this scheduling conflict and I hope this is um, fine for as many people as possible. Other than that, we also have uh, the second newsletter of Alaska that is for the second quarter of 2023. Uh, you can find some information on the association, on some structural uh, developments, for example, um, and the governance model on our activities all around accepting new open source projects into the association. You will also get an, an insight into recent Yauk developments, which is very interesting. And um, so you can also just find the newsletter on our website as well. Are there any other events or news uh, that you would like to share? I know it's summer and there is not too much going on, but maybe there is something interesting. If not, um, well, stay tuned for the next Tech Talks. Um, if you haven't already, you can find our calendar file on the Alaska Cloud website, or you can also just uh, write us an email to hello at alaska.cloud and you will just receive monthly reminders. And all of our Tech Talks are recorded and uploaded on YouTube. Um, so in case you missed the past Tech Talks, just check them out there. Now let's reveal the uh, Tech Talk number eight for August. We have um, Christoph Fetzer from Scontain. He will be talking about uh, using confidential computing for protecting data, code, and secrets of application. Uh, so that sounds very interesting as well. Uh, Christoph is actually the COO of Scontain and is a, is a um, confidential computing expert. So that should be very, very insightful and interesting. Now, with that, I guess we are ready for today. Um, I wish every one of you a very nice summer break, even though it might be raining where you are right now, <laughs> but still enjoy the summer. Um, have a nice day, a nice rest of the week, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you from my side too. Yes, thank, thank you, you Patrick, again. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.